Welcome back to Investor's Reality. Currently, Turkey is launching an offensive against an ally of the United States in a country where Russia and the US are fighting another proxy war besides Ukraine. This video is an update on the situation in Turkey related to what's going on in Syria. Please don't forget, Turkey is perhaps the most important piece of the puzzle when it comes to the proxy war currently being fought out in Ukraine between Russia and the US. But before we start, I want to welcome you to Investor's Reality. You see, governments will change and monetary systems, they will implode and finally the future of finance will be introduced. In fact, the future of finance is already being built right in front of our eyes and it's being built on the blockchain. It's only a matter of time until the CBDC will be rolled out across the globe. And if you want to understand how to profit from this financial revolution, well then I advise you to follow this channel, watch my crypto videos and join my live streams. Because there's one thing I can guarantee you, and that is, there's no one who's better than me when it comes to analyzing and investing into the future of finance. My name is Nico Harachi, and I am number one. Over the course of the last two weeks, Turkey has launched a number of airstrikes into Syria. And President Erdogan has now announced that he's intending to launch a land offensive. So this is a really big military push by Turkey. And Syria is a real powder kick in terms of what's going on because there are a number of different fractions, all of whom are fighting against each other and they are supported by different sides. Russia has interest in Syria, as does the United States. And both Russia and the US, and this is an interesting fact though, is that they are not on the same side or against Turkey's current involvement. So I'm going to give you some more detail on what's going on in Syria, how the country got itself into the situation it's in, who's backing who, because that's really interesting, and what Turkey are trying to achieve through their military strikes and what the potential implications of this could be. Obviously, we have still got the ongoing military conflict in Ukraine. So now up until this point, Turkey, they have taken an entirely neutral stance. Prior to the war, they had a strong relationship with both Russia and Ukraine. And they've managed to maintain that position over the course of the last eight to nine months or so. And President Erdogan had a meeting with President Putin recently and came out of it stating that both countries intended to do more trade together. Furthermore, Turkey wants to be a part of BRICS and Turkey is also a part of NATO. So... Up until this point, relations between Turkey and Russia, they have been very strong. But what's going on in Syria could perhaps have a negative impact on this special relationship. Turkey has recently undertaken a number of airstrikes into Syria. And this is causing political tensions, not just with Syria and the Kurds, but also with Russia and the United States. So before we get into the detail on that, I thought... What we should or what should be worth doing is giving you a bit more background on Syria so that you can get a better understanding of the current situation. Obviously, I hope you know Syria is a country in the Middle East that has boundaries, borders with Turkey, Iraq, Jordan, Lebanon and Israel. And since gaining independence in 1946, the country has experienced instability due to friction between the country's social um, societies, religious and political groups. Now, important factor is that natural gas was discovered in the country in 1940 and now forms a large part of the country's exports. Oil was also discovered in commercial quantities in 1956 and became Syria's leading natural resource exports in the 1970s. Now, production peaked in the mid-1990s but has since been in decline. Now, this chart shows the makeup of Syria's exports, and as you can see, it's still dominated by oil and gas. Now, despite growing revenues from oil exports, Syria's economy began to stagnate in the 1980s. Rapid population increase hindered economic growth, while the intensification of agriculture ran into natural barriers, such as the limited availability of fresh water and high cost of desalination. So industrial development was slowed by bottlenecks in production, inflation, government corruption, smuggling, foreign debts, and very heavy bureaucracy. 
and only very limited success in encouraging private sector investments, which also posed severe economic problems, as did spending on the military and the intervention in Lebanon. The country overcame some of the economic difficulties by obtaining aid from oil-rich states in the Middle East. And as the Soviet Union disintegrated, Syria turned to China for military supplies. In March 2011, following the Arab Spring uprisings in other countries, anti-government protests also broke out in Syria. And the Assad regime reacted very aggressively, deploying the country's powerful security services to break up rallies. Now, the government cracked down on protesters and the opposition drew strong condemnation by international leaders and human rights groups. So by the summer of 2011, Syria had begun to descend into international isolation. The United States and the European Union, they did what they do best. They imposed sanctions that included travel bans and asset freezes. In addition, an arms embargo was applied to the entire country. The violence also strained Syria's relationship with regional allies, particularly Turkey, objected to the government's use of violence against civilians. As opposition militia grew and increased their attacks on government forces, the uprisings began to take on the character of a civil war. So by late 2012, the military situation appeared to be approaching a stalemate. Rebel fighters, they kept a firm hold on northern areas, but were held back by deficiencies in equipment, weaponry and organization. Meanwhile, government forces they weakened by defections also seemed incapable of making any large gains. So daily fighting continued in contested areas, pushing the civilian death toll higher and higher. Then the leader of Al-Qaeda in Iraq announced his intention to combine his forces in Iraq and Syria under the name of Islamic State in Iraq and the Levant, ISIL. ISIL retained considerable strength in eastern Syria, establishing a zone of exclusive control and control of a wide swath of territory straddling the Iraq-Syria border. In September 2014, ISIL turned its attention to northern Syria, attacking Kurdish towns near the Syria-Turkey border. Then, Kurdish militia, aided by airstrikes and weapon deliveries from the international anti-ISIL coalition, fiercely repelled ISIL for several months. Over the next two years, the US led a campaign to destroy ISIL, which had gradually expanded to include heavier airstrikes and sizable contingents of ground troops in eastern Syria. And they continued to make progress. In June 2017, a mostly Kurdish force supported by U.S. air power and special forces attacked ISIL's de facto capital in Syria. After about three months of fighting, the city was declared free of ISIL forces. The conflict has continued to remain unsolved, unresolved, and after dozens of Turkish soldiers were killed in late February of 2020, Turkey undertook a brief offensive against the Syrian army. The escalation ended after a ceasefire was brokered by Turkey and Syria's ally Russia. The conflict, however, remains unresolved and in some areas of the country, the people of Syria are entirely dependent on humanitarian aid. And now let's talk about the Syrian fractions. The current president of Syria is Bashar al-Assad. and His regime is supported by Russia. They're providing military support. This is actually the Russian forces rather than just supplying guns and equipment. So Russia is, safe to say, fully behind the existing regime. Now, the main reason that the US got involved in Syria was to fight the fight against ISIS. As the US government claimed, ISIS were behind the 9-11 attacks in the US. However, speaking about 9-11, what the hell happened to World Trade Center 7? In case you know, then let me know. <laughs> anyway, after 9-11, the US authorities, they did announce their war on terrorism. And therefore, they did send a lot of forces into Syria in order to break up the ISIS regime. And the way they did that was to provide military support and equipment to the Kurdish people in Syria. Now, the Kurds, they are not the ruling party in Syria. So what we got is a situation where the US is supporting a group that's not in power and Russia is supporting the existing regime. So Russia and the US, they are on opposite sides here. It's similar to... Ukraine. 
Now, the situation with regards to Turkey is slightly different because this relates to the Kurdish people and the Kurds who originated from an area called Kurdistan in the Middle East is a race of around 40 million people, currently split between four different countries. So they're living in Turkey, Iran, Iraq and Syria. So the Kurdish people, they don't have their own country and Kurdistan does not exist anymore. And the biggest group worldwide of Kurds is in Turkey, where around 15 million Kurds they live, which represent, however, less than 20% of the total population in Turkey. Now, in 1978, a group of Kurds in Turkey set up uh, the Turkish or the Kurdish Workers' Party, which, is, which has also been called, or it's called themselves PKK. And they demanded independence for the Kurdish people and wanted to have their own territory. And in order to force their demand, the PKK got involved in a number of terrorist incidents and were officially designated as a terrorist group by Turkey, the United States and the European Union in the early 1980s. And because the Kurdish people live in Turkey, Iran, Iraq and Syria, the PKK started to build its power base, particularly in Syria. And the presence of the PKK in Syria is really the true issue that Turkey has. Now, on the 13th of November this year in 2022, an explosion occurred in central Istanbul in a busy shopping area which killed six people and injured another 81. And this was declared another new terrorist incident and the PKK were identified as the group behind this bombing. So in direct response to this bombing, the Turkish authorities they launched a number of air attacks directly into the Kurdish area of Syria. And Turkey's defense minister has confirmed that almost 500 targets in Syria and Iraq have been hit over the course of the last two weeks. And that 200, more than 250 militants have been neutralized. So following these raids, President Erdogan he has confirmed that Turkey's air operations against Turkish militia in northern Syria were only the beginning and that it will launch a land operation when convenient so we don't know exactly when he said turkey was more determined than ever to secure its southern border with a security corridor whilst ensuring the territorial integrity of both syria and iraq where it has been conducting operations against the turkish uh, against the kurdish militants now, Russia, who also plays a big part in this, they have actually asked Turkey to refrain from a full-scale ground offensive in Turkey. Now, they hope that their arguments they will be heard in Ankara and other ways of resolving the problem will be found. And Russia, they went on to say that the United States, well, they were following a destructive course in northeastern Syria and resolving the Kurdish issue would be an important factor in stabilizing the situation in the region and that the Kurds, the hostages of the United States, which hindered the resolution of the crisis, and that without the US presence, the Kurdish issue could have been resolved very, very quickly. And to make things worse, it's been reported that the Turkish airstrikes against Turkish fighters have come within 300 meters of the base that the US forces are located in Syria. So Pentagon, they said that airstrikes in Syria directly threatened the safety of U.S. personnel who are working in Syria with local partners in order to defeat ISIS. So immediate de-escalation is necessary in order to maintain focus on defeating the ISIS missions and ensure the safety and security of personnel on the ground. So currently the Pentagon are preparing to resume full ground operations alongside Kurdish partners in northern Syria. And this is a move that risks further inflaming relations with NATO ally Turkey. Now, while the United States view Kurdish led fighters as a key ally in the fight against ISIS, Turkey, on the other side, they view the Turkish fighters as a single terror organization. So, what's my conclusion today? Uh, I think it's fair to say that it is very confusing, and the Middle East has for many, many years, been a confusing place. Now, in terms of the geopolitical environment, Turkey is really getting involved in a military conflict. It sent fighters directly into Syria, and it looks like they are preparing to do a land invasion. President Erdogan, he has talked about tanks moving into Syria. Now, it's not the first time that Turkey been involved in Syria. 
You see, Syria is on the border of Turkey, and so there's been a long, long standing issue between the two nations. But what is happening right now is obviously coming at a really, really bad time because both the US and Russia are involved in Syria on different sides. And although there's no direct link between what's happening in Syria to what's going on in Ukraine, it still has some kind of impact, right? Or some correlation. So Turkey sending forces in uh, is probably most likely going to upset both the US and the Russia, but most likely is going to <laughs> anger one nation more than the other. From the US perspective, Turkey is launching an offensive against the US ally. So that's going to cause a real problem. And um, we should not forget that the US and Turkey, they're both members of NATO. So they are both part of the same military pact. But Turkey is sending in the army as a direct result of terrorist incidents and that have happened within their country. And that's over the course of the last couple of weeks. So you could say there's a lot of similarities here uh, when it comes to US official involvement in Syria. You see, the US, they went in after ISIS terrorist attacks, right, following the 9-11 bombing. And, and, and that also leads me to another question. Um, was the US really trying to track down terrorists in the heartland or was it in order to secure oil? You see, from my point of view, the US forces in northeastern Syria have a completely different mission. And it is not, from my point of view, to spread democracy nor freedom of speech. I think that their main objective is to secure oil fields and that not only from ISIS, but also from the Syrian government and the Russian forces. Well, anyway, it does look like President Erdogan, he wants to do it quite similar to the US. I mean, not about the oil, but at least to fight terrorism. But the issue that's going on or going to occur is that Turkey potentially could start attacking forces that are aligned or working with the US, and this could cause further political tensions. And at the same time as that, Russia don't want anything to kick off between the Kurds and Turkey because Russia is trying to keep control of the whole area. So this situation has the potential to escalate into something much, much more concerning. And if we do take a step back and look at the bigger picture, there's a general election coming up in Turkey in 2023. And President Erdogan, he really wants to be reappointed as president. We all know that, right? So as we've seen in many countries previously, being involved in a military conflict often unites the people of a country behind the current leader. So there's a potential that Turkey could get involved in a bigger warfare in Syria over the course of the next six months in the lead up to that general election. And the big question is, what will the knock-on implication of that be for the US or, and for Russia? Or for that matter, for the, for the entire world? Because truly, honestly, the last thing that anybody needs right now is another full-scale war. We've seen the devastating impact that the war in Ukraine has had on the global economy, right? It's been driving up the price of oil and gas, food and inflation all around the globe, causing political instability, riots, almost financial economic depression. We've seen a lot of change of governments and it's also causing changes to the supply chain and lots of other major issues. So if we were to have another full-scale war in Syria, that could potentially have further implications. Now, not because Syria is a big provider of any sort of food substances, but because it could draw in other nations. It could mean Russia tries to pull in other countries to support it, not just in Syria, but on a general East versus West new Cold War era or concept. And from my point of view, if this is going to escalate, that could slowly, slowly starting to look like World War III. And my biggest concern here is that this conflict is being used to create political leverage to get people and countries and, and political parties lined up on one side or the other and in order to cause further split in terms of politics and also for the global economy. And this obviously would be very bad news for all of us. Now in case you like this video, then please give me a hit like, smash and subscribe and please Come and join our live streams. It's all about the future of finance. My name is Nico Arachi and I am number one.